Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast with Kate Riga. We're in that period, the sort of the, the, the final days of August, which is always or usually is a slow news period. You know, everybody's trying to get in the last part of their summer. Um, we know it at TPM because, you know, everybody's everybody's on vacation. Everybody's kind of checked out. But we have it's not totally like that this this uh this political season this trial season because we still have the ongoing you know procedural moving forward of Donald Trump's various indictments we're going to talk we're going to talk some about that stuff uh and and it's it's so various and you know it's funny as i was thinking about this as we were starting and i, I don't think you know everybody there there's still a a hot market for takes that somehow being indicted for felonies in multiple jurisdictions around the country and being on trial for all of them while you're running for president is somehow a good thing for you. There's, there's still the kind of, it's, it's, like, it's like the political class in this country. It, it's like, you know, like recovering heroin addicts. It's still calling for them. The Trump 12 dimensional chess, that despite what it seems, it's all going to be in his favor. Now, I think we've seen that within the Republican primaries, it kind of is the sense, it, it is the case in this limited sense, at least with these, with these um, indictments, that it has, you know, he, he was always going to be the nominee. And if you didn't get that, you need to read more TPM. Because you're but you're behind, you're missing something, but certainly it 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 sped it up. It it cut off the very limited avenues that someone else had to at least make it a competition. Um, but with that said, I it 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 does kind of occur to me at a certain point it becomes sort of procedural, at least at this stage of the process. We keep having new hearings. We're going to talk about, you know, everybody had to show up in Georgia and get their mug shots taken. And in Georgia, um, you know, it's not a one man play in Georgia. It's a big cast and you've got all of them. Someone, some of them we've barely even heard of before these kind of, you know, bit characters in the, in the plot down in, uh, in Georgia. And then we had uh, we had uh, uh, it with uh, Judge Chutkin in, in D.C. coming up with the trial date. A lot to talk about. We're also going to talk about something that uh, Kate has been on, a story that Kate has been on for a long time now. You know, this uh, the effort of Ohio abortion rights activists to get um, pretty expansive abortion rights protecting language into the state constitution. Now, we know that uh, a few weeks ago, um, the opponents lost the ability to change the threshold that you needed for these constitutional amendment referendums. So they lost that. Now they're back to trying to, I mean, it, it's not going to change it, but now they're back to kind of trying to put in summary language that is like, you know, chock full of pro-life language, you know. When you want to when you want to murder your unborn child, you will have the right to do so henceforth in the state of Ohio, that kind of stuff. Not quite literally that, but pretty close, right? So we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about all that stuff uh today. But let, let's let's get started now. We had something that was a pretty big deal that happened earlier this week. That is that we now have a trial date for what's still basically the central trial that Donald Trump faces. There's some reasons why maybe the Georgia one is the central one, because, because it's going to be televised, and that just makes so much difference, right? So much difference. You're not going to, and it's going to be televised. You're not necessarily going to have the prosecutors uh, giving you that kid glove thing where you don't even have to get a mugshot taken or, you know, you get the presidential treatment, uh, all, all of that stuff. But the big one, the big federal one, uh, we now know when it's going to be. It's going to be a little later. It's not going to be in January, the way the prosecution wanted. It's going to be in March. 
It's going to be the beginning of March. Now, we've talked about why that is. There, there's like 20 different moving pieces to understand why that is consequential. As you know, Donald Trump wants these, wants these various trials to be held sometime in 2028 or maybe 2027, so it doesn't interfere with his presidential campaign in, in, in 2028. He wants them in the distant, distant future. Uh, and he literally wanted it in 2026. Literally. That was his proposal. It's not just how early it is and whether or not this trial is going to take place before the, pre you know, uh, uh, before the presidential election, even in the midst of the primaries, before whoever wins the nomination, i.e. Donald Trump, actually gets nominated. We have this issue of the rogue judge down in the state of Florida, who is basically a member of Donald Trump's legal team, right? And her trial is set for May, okay, in May of 2024. And the big question has been, would this other trial, and they're both Jack Smith special prosecutor trials, would this other trial be scheduled before or after that one? Now, if it's after that one, then presumably you're, you know, that trial's in May, maybe you schedule it in July or August or September 2024. But the big key is that if it's after Judge Cannon's trial down in Florida, now she controls the schedule, in effect, for both. And that's clearly what they wanted, right? Because once it's scheduled after her trial, there's going to be delays every 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 trial. There's going to you know there's going to be delays. Uh, uh, legit judge or crooked judge, um, but that means she's controlling the calendar for both. And we've seen that she's not only willing to make sort of farcical rulings on on behalf of Donald Trump. She's willing to totally sacrifice whatever pre professional reputation or judicial reputation she has. Uh, in his behalf. So the key thing was it's scheduled before. So, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces here. A lot of things could happen. But we're pretty sure at this point, this trial is going to happen well before the presidential election, even before the general election really gets on underway. So we're going to talk about all those things um, and, uh, and more. Uh, so, Kate, what what do you make of what do you make of the different judicial stuff we've we've heard about this week? Yeah, so let's just do a, kind of a quick refresher. So as of now, this is the schedule of the four Trump indictments. We've got the you know federal January six overturning the election one that is March fourth. That's the one, Josh. You just you went through, and that Trump's people were trying to say they wanted it to be twenty twenty six because discovery would just take so honking long. And they had no way to know that this case was coming, um, which was interesting because this kind of fight was the first time we saw this judge kind of wrangle with Trump's guy. And this was uh, this lawyer, Lauro, and he was like getting emotional and raising his voice and saying, you know, Trump is an innocent man and blah, blah, blah. And she uh, repeatedly kind of told him to to take his temperature down. She opened the proceedings by saying she's not going to kind of give the government or Trump exactly what they wanted. But, you know, as you say, the government kind of wanted January <laughs> and they got March and Trump was like, let's do it next century, you know. So so that's March 4th. Then we've got the New York Stormy Daniels case on March 25th. Then we've got the Florida documents case on May 20th. And then the Georgia one is what's still kind of in flux. Um, Fannie Willis said that she wanted March 4th to begin uh, the, the big 19 indicted uh, trial. But, you know, that seems kind of unlikely now that we've got, you know, this one on the same day. And then you've got the New York one just a few weeks later. And also there's already going to be some moving pieces to the Georgia one because I, I really, his name might be Chesabro, but I think Cheesebro is so much funnier that we're going to go with that. It's worth it. Yeah. yeah. Cheesebro requested a speedy trial. So his is going to start October 23rd, as in 
you know, in less than two months. And there have been some others that have also requested the speedy trial. And as we'll get on, we'll get into later in the show, you've also got some of them trying to uh, move their cases to federal court from state court in the Georgia situation. So that one's still a little bit in flux. But the other three, you know, those are kind of set. And we had uh, Chukin, no, Chukin said, Chutkin, the Ch- yes. Chutkin said that she had also um, coordinated with the New York case, which is at the end of March, kind of like got in touch there to make sure that that wouldn't be a huge, uh, you know, overlapping issue. So We've got these set. The March 4th, the one that's going to start a, start it off, you know, unless Georgia somehow gets pushed earlier, which seems pretty unlikely given just the size and the logistics of that case. But the March 4th one is the day before Super Tuesday in the primaries. Um, it's, you know, we've talked about this the whole time, the extent to which these trials were going to be interspersed with the the election campaign schedule. But now we can see kind of with clarity <laughs> the very primaries and, and caucuses that they will be kind of, you know, stepping on. And as of now, we've got at least the first three that are all happening before the Republican nominating convention, which um, is going to be in the summer. So, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, I think it's a bit, we have some like liberal wish casting going on that these trials will change all the baked in dynamics about Trump and will kind of finally make Republicans see the errors of their ways and come the convention, there will be a brokered convention. And one of these like fringe people is going to rise up, you know, whether that be uh, Ramaswamy or Glenn Youngkin will kind of be there to be the recipient of the nomination and like everything will change. And I'm not saying that by any means, but it is going to be a hell of a schedule for Donald Trump and co kind of just in and out of court and then to the primary and then back to court. And you know that, you know, his legal team is kind of going to do every procedural fight they can along the way. So they are going to want to push, push, push it as much as possible. So it's just going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. Well, it's also uh, Chutkin. She addressed this uh, it, in a in a general sense where she, she one of her uh, not rulings, but in the discussion of when the, when, you know, when things would be, she made clear kind of like your professional obligations aren't my problem. You know, you chose to run for president and you're going to have to work around this trial. So the idea that, that Trump is going to be able to, is, is going to be able to say, Hey, can't be there. Got a debate, got an election. Sorry that, that she has, I mean, rightly, how else could it, you know, what else could it be? You know, I mean, can you really, can that really be a reason you can't show up or, you know, everything is, everything is indefinitely delayed. But I think we saw uh, not surprisingly that, and it's, it's not even a matter of like, Oh, you know, judge Chutkin, she's a total badass. I mean, she's great, very respected judge, but this is how judges work, right? It's it, the, the, the thing that went on with uh, Aileen Cannon down in Florida that's the that's the exception. That's that's the weirdness um, of of just where you come in and say, "Hey, I'm I'm Trump, and this is weird." And and the judge says, "Yeah, this is weird. Let's 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 slow everything down. Great what's point. going? <laughs> yeah, what's going on here?" Um, so yeah, that is going to be that's. I mean, you know, one thing just when you're going through the calendar, it's it's hard for me to imagine. I mean, is this is this trial, the federal trial on January 6th stuff, is it really going to be done in like two weeks? I mean, it really does seem like the the New York case is pretty soon there. I assume when she when she referenced having, I guess she talked to the chief judge in the New York State, you know, district or whatever kind of, uh, um, you know, part of the structure of the of the state judiciary in New York kind of, you know, runs that stuff. I assume part of that conversation was like, look, you, you may have to put, you know, you may have to push yours back a little bit um, just because I'm going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And that all makes sense. And 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 to remind everybody, um, Alvin Bragg basically, uh, you know, addressed a month or two ago, sort of like, hey, I'm willing to be flexible, you know, not I'm not my trial can kind of take back seat to the federal to the federal uh, uh, trials and, 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 and 
so forth. So um, it's a lot. And, and you know, the, the thing is, I guess there's two things on, as you say, the sort of the liberal wish casting that suddenly the, the Matt Gateses are going to say, oh, it's too much. Trump, you did such bad things. I just can't support you. I, I have to, I have to, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've got to support Asa Hutchinson. I've seen the light. Right. Obviously, that, obviously, that's not going to happen. But that also doesn't mean that nothing is going to happen. And I, and I think that there's what we need to be thinking about the, the, the parameters, the, 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 the spectra of of possibilities that we need to be looking at is one, there are a lot of people who tell me, and I think this is right to some extent, even though it doesn't resonate with the way I see things, that at the point at which Donald Trump becomes a convicted felon, that is going to be a serious hurdle for a lot of people, just the fact in itself. Now, does that mean his support is going to drop to like, you know, it's Biden 80, Trump 20? Of course not. But we live in a we live in a a highly polarized era in which basically all federal uh, presidential elections are more or less 50-50 contests, right? There's no 60-40. Even 55-45 is is a rarity um uh these days. So small differences can you know, can can be a big deal. Um, the other thing is, of course, the Trump diehards aren't gonna aren't going to abandon him. But as we know, the, the the election is not about Trump diehards. The election is going to be fought at basically the loosely attached to politics ten percent of the electorate in the middle. Of you know, and maybe, maybe at the extreme end, the twenty percent, right? The the sort of the 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 section of the electorate that would get you from sixty forty in one direction, or forty sixty in in you know in the other direction. Really, more like the kind of the central ten percent. And in those in that context, having you go on trial for these things, I actually think can. Is, is is not nothing right those, those things those things uh those things have an effect i mean one of the things it's it's there was a um there was a poll that came out i can't remember who the pollster was at the moment poll that came out uh a week or so ago maybe it may be a touch more and um what that poll showed is that something like a third of the electorate says they're not very familiar with the charges against trump and again, that shouldn't surprise us, right? I mean, Kate and I literally are in the political news business. Okay, you're listening to this podcast. You're kind of like a professional observer of politics. That's not the whole, the whole country, to put it mildly, is not like that, right? Um, so these things can have an effect. And it's not this either or between... Every trial is going to help Trump. He planned it in advance because this is sent all that kind of crap to, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to devastate him. It's it's more marginal. Right. I mean, a lot of people, they've they have sort of sold themselves to Donald Trump and the cult and everything like that. But these things, these things still matter. That doesn't mean Trump's going to lose or all that kind of stuff. But these things are not negligible. They're a pretty big deal. There's no question about that. Right. And one other thing that um, I thought was interesting about Chutkin's kind of back and, fo- back and forth with Lauro is that he kept doing the whole, you need to treat Trump like any other defendant, like he's innocent, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, she kind of counters saying that Trump has many more resources than your average, you know, criminal defendant. And and this was all part of, you know, the, the whole conversation was in the universe of there's so much discovery. That's why we need two years to go through a kind of thing. But it it's interesting in these first glimpses that we're getting of these judges and kind of how they're going to conduct these trials, which are just so full of kind of like pitfalls for the judges. They know that if they do anything at all adversarial, even during these kind of procedural motion type back and forths, that that's probably going to earn them 
a rant from Trump, you know, on Truth Social. And if not that, his diehards are going to circulate her picture and uh, probably research into like where she lives and have any of her relatives ever given to Democratic candidates before. And, you know, the extent of that is scary and there's always the capacity for violence here. And at the kind of lower end, you're just going to have your courtroom be flooded with angry, threatening callers, right? Which is not exactly a comfortable experience. So it's kind of interesting to see her starting out with, I I think, you know, professional. And she definitely opened with a kind of like, I'm not going to give either side what they want on purpose, I think. But, you know, she didn't sit there and kind of, take this professional or this big, you know, emotional, theatrical lawyer uh, performance, she kind of, you know, she pushed back and was like, well, you know, that's not really true. Uh, Actually, a lot of this discovery is duplicative. Actually, a lot of it's already in the public record. A lot of it is tweets like you you guys, you know, this a lot of it you did. Exactly. You should be familiar with it. (laughs) Right. Um, So kind of interesting to see her starting out on that. Take no bullshit foot. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you know the the question there there's a question that has come up to me a lot, and it's sort of implicit in what you just or you know kind of uh, baked into what you just discussed. How I mean, we didn't unfortunately we didn't actually see what we're describing here because there's no video, there's no you know there, we don't get to hear this stuff. But as it was sort of universally portrayed, Trump's lawyer, a uh, Loro, got a little like hysterical and a little like amped up and, and often, um, often, uh, lawyers will kind of keep that for the jury or keep that for the, um, you know, if it's a televised trial to the extent you're trying to kind of try it in the public domain, blah, 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 blah. You generally don't do it in like before the judge in, in, in this kind of highly procedural thing because the judge doesn't give a shit or, or, you know, they're, they're not, it's not their first time, right? This isn't about like a video going viral or you're going to sort of like make some case to the, I don't know, the jury. Cause you know, maybe it's not the first time for every juror, but basically, right. They're not professional trial people. And so you kind of wonder, is this, to what extent does he just kind of have to do that to satisfy his client? Right. And one thing that is that has uh, I've I've been wondering about through this is, uh, you know, the government made a fairly aggressive proposed trial date in, in January, which, you know, this is a complex case. Uh, there's there's depending on which way you want to think about it different people will tell you different things about the complexity, but it's, it's a, it's a trial of a former president for trying to overthrow the government. I mean, that's inherently pretty complex from a, from a number of different standpoints. Um, uh, but what was, what was Trump's lawyer thinking proposing 2026? Cause that's obviously absurd. That's obviously an absurd proposition. I mean, just by every on, you know, <laughs> By every metric, that is totally absurd. And clearly, that was, I don't know what that was. Because in my thought, and I don't know, I I think at the end of the day, I think a competent professional uh, federal judge, which Judge Shutkin clearly is, is going to just do a date that kind of makes sense by the standards of normal practice, um, whatever unique circumstances, blah, 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 blah. But when, when, when I heard that, I kind of thought, I really wonder why they did that. Because that kind of gave her an out in, in my mind. Like if they had come back and I mean, okay. So, so the, the, the government is making an aggressive, but not unreasonable proposal of January. Okay, so we're now, uh, that's what, five months away, something like that. Okay. Um, if, if, if the Trump side had come back and said, and remember that May, I believe late May date down in Florida is a key one because what are you going to get here? 
what you what's probably doable is to get it after that trial. And again, once that's the case, Judge Cannon down in Florida is kind of in charge of the schedules of both because she can keep delaying and that's going to keep pushing the the DC trial. Okay. So, what if they had come back and said, "Hey, this is this is a we've got we've got a lot of trials. Um this is unlike the thing down in Florida. You know, there's lots of cases where people are are charged with mishandling classified documents. This is the first trial ever where a former president is being uh, charged with trying to, you know, remain in office, overthrow the, you know, overturn the election, overthrow the government, whatever you want to call it. Y- you got to give us time here. There's a lot of work we have to do. We really need this to be at least in the late summer. Now, if she comes back and says, nope, February, I think at least some people would say, reasonably or not, like, you know what? That wasn't that unreasonable to say. It's a complex case. Why didn't she split the difference? But when they come in and say, hey, we want 2026, I think basically everybody says, okay, that's absurd. So you kind of, you had a chance to propose something and you just, you basically gave up your chance because you proposed something that was like a, a stunt. And again, I suspect at the end of the day, she probably would have picked something like March, but I don't know. That just seemed counterproductive to me. I don't, I don't know why they did that. It's like someone taking the advice to kind of like highball it during your salary negotiation. And then they come in and they're like, $10 million, please. And then they're yeah, like, that way I'll probably land somewhere around $5 million. <laughs> no, that's exactly. This. And, and, and what, and I think we know what happens if you're in, if you're in a, if you're in a salary negotiation over a job that is, you know, somewhere between a hundred and $200,000 and you propose $5 million, they say, you know, you know what? We're, I think we're going to go in another direction. It's right. like weird. And we don't know what the fuck that was about. <laughs> you know, obviously the judge can't go in another direction, but in a way she did go in another direction, which was to give the government what it wanted to get an early 2024 trial date, to get it before the case in Florida. And, you know, it's not January, but they didn't need it to be January. They just needed it to be early. And, and, you know, one thing I think we, we, one thing we should not lose sight of here is that clearly Donald Trump wants to delay this. Mm-hmm. And because Donald Trump runs the Republican Party, the organizational Republican Party and the the leading stakeholders of the Republican Party were all on board with that. But by any objective measure, this is much more fair to the Republican Party. You don't want it to be after they've already nominated him, after they've made it 100% official. You certainly don't want it to be like in, in September of, of 2024, in the heat of the election that he's on trial for you know th- this kind of stuff. It's certainly not great in political terms to have it when it is. But I think, and in this sense, it was really, I just think objectively it was the most responsible decision for the government and the most fair to the Republican Party to say, we're going to get this out of the way before you put this whole thing to bed and like fully commit to Donald Trump. Now, do we think you're going to you're going to, you know, rethink it and nominate someone else? No, but you at least the party deserves the opportunity. So, you know. There you go. So and let's be clear about why Trump wants to delay these trials. You know, the most obvious ones of the federal set is so he can win the election in 24 and then pardon himself and whoever of the lackeys that he chooses to be worthy of the pardon. Um, But also there there are kind of like downstream pros to him for delaying as well, which include, you know, getting some of the other indicted people for their trials to go first so he and his team can kind of get a preview of what the prosecutors are going to bring, you know, strengthen their defense, see how various defenses work with the jury trials. It's like they get this kind of like dry run, a rehearsal to see how everything works before it's his turn. And also, if some of these people do go to trial before him and say, you know, get off, 
don't get convicted. That's going to kind of strengthen his case down the line if the arguments that the prosecutors are using are similar or overlapping. It'll just kind of give him a weapon to invalidate big swaths of their arguments um, and to kind of arrange all of this from a spectator position instead of having to do, you know, trial by fire and kind of do everything in real time. And let, let's remember something more general about Donald Trump. I mean, yes, the fundamental thing is he needs to get back into office and whether it's literally pardon himself or just kind of like make it go away, that's the big thing. But delay is like a central feature of Donald Trump's whole public life. I mean, we see that in every, we saw it in every, you know, the, the tax returns, the, the different, all the different, you know, uh, all the legal fights he had with with the Democratic House and just everything. Everything is delay, you know, kind of if I can delay it from tomorrow till next week, that's another week when I don't have to do what you want to tell me to do. Um, so at a, at, a, at a certain level, it's almost overdetermined. Delaying stuff is just what Donald Trump tries to do. And, and, and even even you see it in his in his business world. Right. I mean, we sort of the way he's notorious for not, um, you know, not paying contractors, stiffing contractors. The basic thing there is kind of like, you know, you need the money. No, you come back in a month or sue me or something, you know, delay, delay, delay. It's just, it's, it's just fundamental to, uh, to, you know, to how he operates. Yeah. It goes beyond the schedule of this, of 2024. Let's talk about the other kind of Trump universe legal proceeding that happened on Monday. This was down in Georgia. Mark Meadows, to the shock of everyone, took the stand um, and testified for like three hours, which w- the reason it was so surprising is because it really, you know, it opens himself up to cross-examination, um, to saying something that hurts his case in real time. You know, it's kind of all the obvious effects of having one of the people who's under indictment just talking without, you know, obviously his lawyers are in the room, but like he has to respond to the questions kind of in real time. And this was all in the service of his attempt to get his case moved from Fulton County, from Georgia, to a federal court. The thinking seeming to be that, you know, Fulton County is a Democratic county. Um, The hope is that a federal court's jury would pull from a greater cross-section in the state. So maybe got him more uh, politically kind of sympathetic jury members. And he's staking all this on the argument that Everything he did to kind of help overturn the election, he did in his capacity as White House chief of staff, that he was a federal officer at the time, and so he should be tried in federal court. And now you've got some of the others kind of trying to make, I think, what are weaker versions of like a, a, a fairly solid argument on his part. But you've got, you know, Jeffrey Clark trying to claim the same and then some of like the fake electors saying they were working you know, at behest of the president. So they were working as federal officials. But, you know, Meadows case is not totally ironclad here. Like there are pretty obvious holes that it's hard for him to get around, including how just infused with politics, everything that he did is. So like part of making this case is he has to prove that he was working as White House chief of staff and not as a member of the Trump campaign team. Now, this has always been one of those like weird wrinkles of our system that it's those two things are never purely genuinely separated. You know, if you're working for the president, you to whatever extent are working for him to be reelected. And, you know, sometimes those uh, the chasm you have to maintain between those two things can like end up in in what we talked about with Ron DeSantis, right? Like the the super PAC can't talk to the candidate and they have to do it online. And it's like those kind of silly differentiations. But for Meadows, there are clear cut examples in the record that make it really hard for him to say with any kind of legitimacy, nothing I did was political and was part an extension of the campaign. And that is that kind of comes through in Many episodes, but the one that he that the prosecutors kind of kept badgering him with when he was on the stand, which is when he 
went to Georgia um, and kind of busted into the room where they were doing the this ballot certification stuff. And, you know, his defense is as flimsy as like, well, it was the holidays and my adult children live near there and I read about it in the paper. So I thought I would like just stop, stop by. by. <laughs> I was on, va- I was vacationing in the area. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the thing, and this is, this is a, I'm glad you brought up because when, when, when people hear they're going to move it to the, you know, to the federal system, it sounds like, you know, suddenly you're in, you're in a federal trial, you know, everything, it, it's not very different. It's really the practical effect here is, you know, it's still under Georgia law. Um, it doesn't, doesn't change the legal regime. The, the practical difference is just the jury pool that Fulton County, you're Fulton County, which is, which it, surprisingly at this at, at this point is is pretty democratic and the federal district just encompasses more georgia as you said it's it's you get a um a more politically favorable jury the other thing though i mean you you bring up this issue of he has to basically say you know almost like qualified immunity right he has to say hey, as a government official you got to you know treat me under the under the law of the of the jurisdiction but the other thing is there's very little case law about this. Like this isn't kind of how many other times have we tried, you know, needed to move something, you know, uh, move a case into uh, uh, the federal courts, it, especially here where you have, you know, needless to say, when it's about trying to overturn an election, we don't really know what's going to happen here. It's it's not, it, it, it we, we don't know. It's, 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 there's just very little precedent. And, um, they at least have some argument. I mean, he was an employee of the federal government. He was, you know, he, he chief of staff is not a constitutional position. It didn't even exist until about 65 years ago. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of the president's right hand. So it's not a crazy argument. It's not a, it's not a crazy argument. Yeah. And then, you know, Willis obviously doesn't want it to move to federal court. I think both, you know, the, the big thing state to federal is you lose the cameras. There are no cameras in any federal court. So, I mean, that would be an especial bummer for us, but then also, you know, her whole thing premised on the RICO law in Georgia is that this was a complex sprawling conspiracy and that Trump was at its head. And so her choosing to kind of bring the case under this law means that she has to prove the kind of interconnectedness, the idea that even the like lowly foot soldiers, the fake electors were just a strand in this grand plot orchestrated and kind of pushed by Donald Trump. And the problem is if you start to kind of lose people here and there to federal court, it's just going to make it harder for her to make that comprehensive argument that everyone's involved and that everyone's kind of driving towards the same central purpose. Yeah, I I suspect it's not going to work because the the argument I mean look, let's let's look at it from the other from the other standpoint. It, like let's imagine, I mean kind of hard to imagine there's a democrat in this position, but there's some there's some argument like okay, you're indicting a former and possible future president um, this is something with national implications for all the obvious. I mean, that's certainly the case. Should this just be up to one local court system in one state? Like that, that, that can't be right. This has to, you know, this is, this is a federal thing, federal implications. This, you know, this should be tried in the federal system. There's a logic to that. There's unquestionably a logic to that. I doubt they'll, I doubt it will work just because it's a kind of a bad, it's a, it's a tough precedent to set. And um, I think the, just in our system, the sort of the equities involved in, you know, you committed the crime in Georgia. You should have thought of that when you committed the crime and we're just going to leave it there. Um, but I just want to, I just wanted to make the case that this is not, this is not to be classed with Trump saying that, you know, he should introduce evidence about Hunter Biden or he should be tried in 2026. It's not an insane argument and it's not an impossible argument. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and also, 
part of the trickiness in like granting the request is that it does the whole idea of like Trump and co not being happy with juries in predominantly blue areas. It's just so into the bloodstream, even if it's coming from like separate of these indictments that I think it's just unavoidable that that's the motivation and that everyone kind of knows that's the motivation. Yep. And that's going to make a judge feel kind of icky this idea that they get to choose the their jury or that they get to yeah. kind of rig it to get a more favorable one you know that's not i don't think that's going to sit well um and so we have meadows motion to move his case to federal court that's being handled by steve jones who is an obama appointee um but who kind of like you know has the straight shooter kind of uh reputation you know like he struck down georgia's uh, a six-week abortion ban but previously he upheld those like big purges from the voter rolls so um he asked yesterday for supplemental briefing briefing from the parties involved specifically on the question that would a finding that at least one overt act of the rico conspiracy occurred under the color of office be enough for removal to federal court so asking them that if the baby is split, you know, if you find that some of his stuff was done under the campaign and some was done under White House chief of staff, does that default to federal court? So we're going to get kind of more filings with both cases making their arguments there. But I agree with you that I think it's not a ridiculous argument. It's not one of these like patented Trump discovery is going to take us 10 years, just like silly type thing. But the ramifications of granting it seem to be pretty large to me, both, like you say, in, in a precedent sense and also in this specific case, because if this works for Meadows, the 18 others are also going to try it. So it's, it's well, going to have not Trump, on. certainly yeah. Trump. I mean, right. you, you can't argue that he wasn't operating in some sense as president, you know, um, there's there's. Uh, there's another there, there's another aspect of this is, you know, you said, uh, you know, predominantly Jew, uh, Jew. <laughs> that's not what I'm going to introduce. <laughs> predominantly blue uh, jurisdictions. They're also predominantly black jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And you see this you see this come up in the discussions about uh, the a, a D.C. jury. Um, you see it in discussions about a, you know, New York jury. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're inevitably that is a what this is about. I do think that is going to have some effect on a, you know, it's it's not a narrowly procedural question, but I do think and I don't know all the words they use, but judges are generally able to take to take some cognizance of the justice and reasonableness of the outcome, right? And, and the other thing is, and we've seen this, and this is something that that on one level is just absurd Trump special pleading, but does go to something about certain trends in our politics. There is when you when you pull it all back, this basic sense that Trump people deserve to be only tried in front of red juries, you know, in, in, in front of juries of their supporters. Um, and that is, you know, look, on the one hand, of course, Trump would ask for that because he asks everything is, you know, everything is just whatever works for Donald Trump. Um, and uh, it is frequently the case that um, – Litigants in a trial will try to get a jury where, you know, in a region that they think is a, is a little better for them. But I do think, again, there's some there's a thread here that is something that goes beyond all of that. And you see it in discussions of increasingly positive arguments for state gerrymandering, um, for, you know, tilting state government in the favor of counties or land or rural parts of the state, basically that the, for lack of a better word, the minoritarian kind of Trump element needs to have a veto on kind of everything, 
they just just doing it on the kind of old fashioned majority vote isn't enough. They need special protections. Right. And in that sense, this 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 jury picking thing is kind of that. You know, we need if you're going to try us, it's got to be like in Idaho. That's the only place that we can be, uh, you know, protected from the machinations of Antifa or the black folks or whoever else the, the current enemy is. So that's it's it's worth keeping that in mind. It's mostly just special pleading nonsense, but there's something else there that that is at least connected to our larger politics. Right. So, you know, those are kind of the first two big battles in these indictment cases, which we will be you know, covering and, and updating you when the judges kind of hand down their opinions um, or their their rulings on these kind of preliminary uh, procedural motions. Um, and we'll kind of wrap the show with something a bit different, which is, as Josh previewed, this um, Ohio abortion amendment, which is coming to the ballot uh, in November 2024, and which we covered the early August election, which Republicans had set to try to raise the threshold to 60% um, to make this coming abortion amendment much harder to pass. That failed pretty handily. But now we are having another kind of 11th hour gambit to to put a finger on the scale on their on their side, which is the Ohio ballot board, which has got, you know, two Democratic politicians and then has got a Republican lawmaker. It's got a person who was appointed by the Republican House. And then the head of the ballot board is our good friend, Frank LaRose, who our listeners will remember from that August 8th uh, push up the threshold vote. He was the big champion about it. He's running against Sherrod or he's running in the primary to challenge Sherrod Brown in 2024 and is against the uh, the abortion amendment that would enshrine protections in the state constitution. So last week, he was the swing vote to approve the summary language of the amendment, which is the language that will appear on the ballot. This will be what voters are voting up or down. The full text of the amendment in a comfort to no one will be available on posters at the polling places. But this summary is going to be, you know, the little paragraph that you vote on. And what they did is they wrote a summary that's actually longer than the full text of the amendment and which does everything from kind of sub out the word fetus for the word unborn child to scrub all mentions of this amendment kind of protecting reproductive freedom for abortion, but also for, you know, miscarriage care and for uh, in vitro fertilization and kind of the whole range of uh, reproductive health care world. That's all scrubbed out. And then they do some just bizarre kind of factually inaccurate rearranging like the kind of crux of the amendment is the state of Ohio does not get to you know prohibit abortions or incur on your ability to have one and they kind of switch that around so it says citizens of Ohio are not allowed to prohibit you know the the termination of an unborn child, just kind of in their anti-abortion mission, kind of just making that like factually incorrect. You know, it's not about preventing citizens from stopping abortions. It's from preventing the state from stopping abortions. So the groups behind the amendment uh, went to the Ohio Supreme Court asking them either to do what they want them to do, which is let's just all agree to have the full text of the summary appear on the ballot that's already been approved by the Republican Ohio AG. Um, you know, it's shorter than this summary. Yeah, so it, let's it is, just do that. It, it, I'm not sure what the di dictionary definition is, but a summary kind of by definition right. cannot be cannot be longer than the original text. I mean, you can have an explication. It's certainly possible that you one can imagine a different kind of a, amendment that was highly technical right. and you needed to explain it to people. But this isn't highly technical. It's 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 as straightforward as the summary is. It's just less. As you said, it's 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 less anti-abortion exactly. than, than, than the text. And now the wrinkle is that Ohio Republicans swept the three open seats on the state Supreme Court in 2022. So it's it went from being one of those kind of old remnants of a Republican court that is still kind of like not nakedly partisan all the time. And now it's just 
quite right wing. Um, and this actually, uh, an earlier language dispute from the ballot board also went up to the court, this coming from that early August election about raising the threshold, because the Republicans were trying to use the word elevate they were like, we just want to elevate the threshold, you know, make it nicer and better for everyone. And everyone was like, that's crazy. Like, so you don't get to use flowery language to cover it up. But the court was like, well, by the Merriam-Webster dictionary, elevate means raise. So it's fine. Um, so we've already kind of had this tango before. But now this is a case where, you know, you've got both like just plain factual inaccuracies in addition to the just objectionable use of kind of anti-abortion language throughout. Um, and from the reporting I've done, people seem to think that the factual inaccuracy stuff, like even this court is going to have a hard time letting it stand because the summary will and just be saying and tell things. Us again, tell us again specifically, which, you know, fetus to, to unborn child, everybody can mm -hmm. understand the difference there. What are the factual, the specific factual inaccuracies that are, that are there? The, I mean, they're, their challenge is like almost 200 pages long. But the kind of big ones are that the piece I mentioned about stopping citizens from prohibiting abortions rather than the state, um, and then kind of s scrubbing all the mentions of the other reproductive care as if they wouldn't apply. Um, because, the you know, the ballot board is under, like, they are supposed to be doing a summary that is, you know, quote, like, not misleading, not deceptive, that kind of accurately summarizes what the full amendment would be. And so people think that there, that's a pretty straightforward case. It's kind of hard to argue that those things aren't just wrong. Um, right. On the anti-abortion language, people are much less confident that um, they'll get a win there. And I was kind of pressing some people about like, if you get an outcome that you don't fully except from the Ohio Supreme Court, right? Even if they like split the baby and say they change the, you have to change it back to it's the state that's prohibiting abortions, but say leave in the unborn child stuff. You know, is there any further recourse? And like I got caginess and not real answers there. And I think part of what's going on is the understanding that there aren't going to be a whole lot of people in Ohio who go into the ballot booth undecided at this point yeah. who are going to kind of like parse the text and be like, well, you know, that that really sways me, especially because the way that these campaigns are carried out, it's, you know, vote yes on issue one. You know, it just it's very kind of like baked into how ballot referenda are campaigned on. Um, and I think there is a pretty broad understanding that like a lot of people are not even going to really read the box. They're going to check yes if they want to, you know, protect abortion rights and, and check no if they don't. Um, but anyway, so the fight's going up to the Supreme Court. Most likely we'll get a decision from them by late next week because we're starting to get to the point where, you know, early voting is is quite early and they've got to have ballots printed and yada, yada, yada. So this is probably going to move pretty fast. But it is just like such, you know, a microcosm of how Republicans, whenever they lack confidence that they can win an election the straightforward way, there is just like shameless. No yeah, just absolutely shameless attempts to like rig it in whatever kind of way they can. And as we saw in the early August election, sometimes to their detriment, where they are so brazenly and obviously kind of like um, interfering in the process that people get pissed and they're like, well, now I'm definitely going to go vote. Whereas if they had kind of stayed low key about it, it would have been a, a sleepy August election that some people might not have heard about. Yeah, I mean, my, it is egregious. And I do think it gets to, well, precisely the issue you're talking about that we have, you know, obviously state referenda, state initiatives, uh, of, of different varieties, you know, some become laws, some become constitutional amendments. Uh, Republicans are now very against these because they have a number of issues that they're on the wrong side of public opinion, and they have really pushed the envelope in game playing about what they are able to do. We know about the case in Florida a few years ago about uh, felon in uh, reenfranchisement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is egregious. It is an example of just they're using their power in. You know, uh, in openly anti-democratic ways and not caring. Having said that, 
I can't imagine it's going to make much difference in this case. I mean, if we we know it, it's true that the uh, the the August uh, you know mini proposition that was a the, the one to increase the threshold that was really aimed at the abortion one. The opponents of it also brought in other issues. Well, you know, if we wanted to have an amend, you know, if we wanted to have a proposition about this or proposition about that, but but fundamentally, it was really seen pretty widely. Everybody understood this was about the abortion thing, and the abortion wasn't even in the text, and it, it you know it, it it worked right. So and and I think just from our experience, just as voters and as people with occasionally logical brains, no one goes in and says, hmm, let me read this one. I mean, you might do that when you when you just have no idea, you'd never heard of it before, but that's clearly not going to be the case in 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 this battle. There's going to be tons of advertising, as you say, it's all going to be yes and no. Um even 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 people who were reading it, most people get what 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 people are talking about unborn child fetus blah 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 so um it's it's kind of like they can't uh ohio republicans ohio you know anti-abortion activists they kind of can't they sort of can't help going there right. even though it's really it's it's going to have very limited effect um it's it's almost uh it's almost kind of like an electoral acting out like, oh yeah, we're gonna call it murdering your unborn baby who you could have had a wonderful life with, but you just had to kill him. You know, I mean, just, it, like I said, it really is kind of like electoral. I mean, having said that, you know, I think most of us assume that this that this uh, uh, constitutional amendment will pass fairly comfortably, maybe you know, in the fifty five plus range but nothing's nothing's nothing certain right and and you want to you know every every little bit helps or hurts so i certainly agree with everybody who's fighting this you should fight it just on principle because it's just it's it's clearly an abuse of power um just trying to make the point i think in effect if this if this amendment was going to win with like real language i don't think it's going to lose because of this fake language yeah i mean it's the kind of thing like where Republicans try some egregious voter suppression mechanism, you know, like shutting down all the polling places in the blue districts or something. And then people show up and stand in line for a million hours and they vote anyway. And then, you know, the Democrat wins. It's it's nobody sitting there saying like, well, the voter suppression didn't matter. Right. Like, obviously it mattered. But we've seen time and time again, these tricks are not always enough to overcome the, you know, the popular sentiment. And I was not saying that you shouldn't fight them or that it's not egregious or that they shouldn't be like publicly shamed for their anti-democratic tendencies. Like you should do all those things too. But like, like you say, this is a case where it's not going to be something that most voters have never heard of that they're encountering for the first time when they, when they come to vote. You know, this is just, it's going to absolutely inundate the state and does that mean there won't be some people on the margins who come to vote and who like don't know what's going on like no and those people should get to have a fair representation of the amendment before them but in terms of the damage that would be done if this kind of anti-abortion language thing ultimately stays on the ballot probably going to be pretty marginal so yeah so that is that is as as we said that's going to be on the ballot in uh November it's going to be a very uh, hard fought thing and it's going to be a pretty big deal just you know we 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 in in a in a in a political context we we talk a lot about percentages and uh you know uh, pr percentages and the procedures involved in these things but if it wins and it more likely than not will win you'll go back to having probably not just like the row standards, but the way this amendment is written, kind of row plus in what's become a fairly red state. And that is a pretty big deal. There's no, there's, you know, that, that is a huge deal. And it's not going to be the last. We're going to, mm -hmm. we're going to see these uh, in a, in a lot of states. And I'm actually curious. I mean, I'm sure that I have no doubt that there are a lot of uh, democratic 
uh, campaign operatives who kind of wish this was actually going to be on the ballot in Ohio, not in November 2023, but in November 2024 to sort of, you know, to, to, to sort of change the shape of the electorate for Sherrod Brown. Maybe conceivably, depending on what is going on in November 2024, even even give Democrats some angle um, in Ohio, although I think there are many Democrats who think that's that's really kind of a possible thing anymore. But anyway, big, big deal. And and I try to bring us back to the fact that there will be a huge real world effect on 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 a lot of people in a way that will be pretty impervious to future uh, elections and specifically gerrymandered elections at the state level. So uh, that is what we have for this week. We will, of course, uh, be back next week with a regular scheduled episode, unless there's some uh, really wild breaking news in which we'll probably kind of jump in and do a little mini episode as we've done a few times over the last uh, several weeks. So that's it. Uh, and I guess that that's all we got. What do you say? All right. See you next week. Later. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Dance Bell for our podcast theme song, and thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe wherever you listen.